So thank you all very much. And thanks to Alzheimer's Europe for having uh, invited me here, even though I'm actually from the United Kingdom. So thank you very much for having extended the, uh, the courtesy to the United Kingdom. And uh, speaking of someone from uh, the UK, oh, sorry, there's a disclaimer there. Oh, there's some housekeeping rules as well. So there we are. And there's a welcome. And there's my talk. <laughs> there we are. So, um, uh, as I said, thank you very much for inviting me. And as someone from uh, the United Kingdom, from the Southwest, uh, obviously one of the things that characterizes people from the UK is often that they apologize for everything. You bump into uh, people in the street and they'll apologize to you. Someone, you know, you, someone bumps into your car and you will apologize to the person that bumped into your car. That's a very much a part of the United Kingdom's way of being. Um, but seldom in the life of the United Kingdom has there been quite so much to apologise for as we have been up to in the last few years. So my apologies. My apologies for this talk. I've been asked in this talk in the next 20 minutes or so to say something about, uh, to put in context some of the issues that exist in agitation and aggression in dementia. I'm going to make the case for them being absolutely core and central to the quality of life of people with dementia, but also of family carers of people with dementia and of paid carers in care homes. In fact, absolutely fundamental to enabling people to live well with dementia and absolutely fundamental to the services we should be providing is the ability to be able to deal with to uh, identify and to help people with managing agitation and other behavioral and psychological symptoms in dementia. So I, so I, I can apologize again for having given away the punchline of my talk again. So what am I talking about here? What are we talking about? Well, I think the first thing to say, I'm using neuropsychiatric symptoms, by the way, as a term that is synonymous with the behavioral and psychological symptoms that you have in the title here. So the first thing to say is that they are common. About 90% of people with dementia at some stage in their illness have behavioral and psychological symptoms in dementia. We know that there are different forms of it. It's a, it's a term that's used to bring together disparate issues in dementia. And we talk a lot about cognitive impairment in dementia because memory is absolutely at the core of things. We talk a lot about functional limitation in terms of not being able to do things in terms of activities of daily living. I'm going to show you some data when you're probably onto your second course. I'm gonna show you some data that shows that those things, while important for all sorts of reasons, cognition and functional limitation, really are not that important in terms of determining the quality of life for people with dementia because people adapt to these things that happen slowly, because families, and I know that Alzheimer's Europe absolutely has at its core that, that, contribute, that, that commitment to families, but families are brilliant at finding ways around and through things. Human beings are machines for adaptation and we're able to adapt to almost anything but we find it very difficult to deal with the neuropsychiatric symptoms in dementia. We also find it complicated to deal with the social impairments that are there in dementia, which also get less of, uh, of a, uh, get, get discussed less as well. So neuropsychiatric symptoms, different sorts. There's agitation and aggression that I'm largely going to talk to talked about today. Depression and things look like and things look like and things that look like depression, really important, really profound way of decreasing people's quality of life. And there's things like sleep disturbance and apathy and psychosis. They're all there. And what they're not is the same thing. We're talking about lots of different symptoms that happen to different people at different stages of their illness. So there is no clear and simple way to say, well, when someone gets to this stage of cognition, they will have this behavior. Absolutely no way of predicting that. There are 
some subtypes of dementia where behavioral disturbance may be earlier or later, but there, but there is such heterogeneity on an individual level in terms of these, but they all cause problems. So let's have a look at agitation. Agitation is really common and it, one, it is one of the things that is most complicated. So you have something that is very intrusive agitation, but you also have something that's very common. Aggression is less common, but obviously can be devastating when you have it. So up to 50% of people with dementia will have agitation at some point. And uh, the, our, our chair has very ably guided you through some of the some of the processes by which one can end up agitated with dementia that are nothing to do with having dementia, uh, but are to do with the environment that you're in and the questions that you're asked. Persistent, so that agitation is common and often persistent. We have quite bad data out there on the natural history of behavioral symptoms of dementia. But if we look at the data, about, about a half of those who have the symptoms seem to have them a month later different sorts of aggression with uh, of, of agitation with aggression or not with agitation uh, with aggression all cause problems okay so the thing about this slide we're looking at causes of agitation the thing that's important about this slide is the last line the last line says dementia it should not be the first assumption that if someone is agitated, they're agitated because they have a neurodegenerative disease called Alzheimer's disease or whatever. Agitation is generally caused by stuff. So unmet needs, pain, hunger, thirst, constipation, delirium, all of those things, treatable things. So the first step isn't to reach for a prescription pad. It is to carry out an assessment that enables us to work out what's going on. Response to stimuli in the environment. Yeah. Overstimulation, understimulation. You're not agitated at the moment because you're munching away at your food and you're perfectly happy in your environment here. You're not agitated, you may be agitated later if the nice man doesn't bring around a glass of wine, a bottle of wine for you when, you're, uh, when your first one's finished. But inconsistent routines, provocation by others, uh, psychosocial needs can cause agitation. Things like stress and loneliness and depression and lack of purpose. So agitation can be an entirely reasonable response to unreasonable and difficult situations. And that is as true for people with dementia as it is people without dementia, because people with dementia are still people. Uh, so uh, dementia for me should be absolutely the last thing that we that we peg it on, that we explain agitation by. I think there's been a very interesting evolution of language. And if we look back into where BPSD comes from, it was coined by a group of people brought together by a drug company in order to create a target for the use of new medications, of antipsychotics at the time, okay? So it's lumping together for a clinical, if you're looking at it nicely, or a, um, or a commercial reason on the part of drug companies from before. So actually that, it, that invites us to think of them as one thing, when in fact they're not. They're a symptom that something else is going on. And it invites us to think that there are pharmacological responses as well, when in fact there aren't. And part of the reason why pharmacological responses may not work is because they are so heterogeneous. Challenging behavior, people have talked about that. And the question is, who's that challenging? Is it challenging the person with dementia? Very seldom. It's challenging for staff or for others. Responsive behavior, well, at least that gives an idea that you may be responding to something. But we're in an evolution of behavior here. Um, but what we do know is that it's not a good thing. We know that it depends, that the outcome depends on cause. So if you have a delirium, there's a significant mortality associated with agitation if you don't treat the underlying illness. We know that it causes deterioration in relatives, relatives' relationships and relations with families. It's costly, causing admissions to care homes and to general hospitals. It increases uh, care of burnout, care of burden, and it decreases quality of life. So agitation is absolutely a target that is well worth us looking at in order to improve people's life quality. 
oh my, how very exciting. This is a slide that is not supposed to look like that. Um, so if this is not, uh, you know, like so many things, I suspect the European Parliament gets this better, but there are some things get lost in translation. Okay, this has got lost in translation. Essentially what this slide shows is that um, if you look at the, the little ones at the top that you can't read, their thing, this is a, a slide done looking at the relationship between quality of life measured using DemQual proxy, which is a measure of quality of life that works across all severities, compared with different characteristics. And what you see here is that cognition and activity limitation essentially do not drive life quality. The things that do are neuropsychiatric symptoms like agitation, aggression, those sorts of things, uh, depression, uh, uh, anxiety, all of those things are the things that drive life quality. Uh, so here we have a, an interlude here where we return to 1990s uh, English or British uh, Brit pop here with the verb here, the verb here. And uh, the point I'm not trying, the point I'm trying to make here is not that Richard Ashcroft has very long shoes in this photographer for photograph, which he does. But the fact that the song that they sung, one of the songs they sung on this album, said now the drugs don't work, they just make you worse. And what I want to show you now in the last five minutes of the talk is firstly, that the drugs don't work. And secondly, that they do make things worse. But thirdly, that actually there are things that we can do that do work and that make things better. It's just that they're not drugs. So uh, they are, again, we're not wishing to, to give away the ending, they are, good quality provision of services that is able to understand what's going on and mount a response and stay with that family in order to be able to resolve things. Stuff that we can do already, but stuff that is very seldom provided across Europe, including the United Kingdom, which is just outside Europe now. So the do the drugs work? Do they make it worse? Well, if you think about the drugs that are available at the moment, uh, you know there are anti-dementia drugs. They do not work for 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 agitation. Dinepazil doesn't work. Memantine doesn't work. Anticonvulsants don't work. Benzodiazepines probably would decrease agitation, but they also make people fall over and break their hips, so they're not a good thing to use. Uh, citalopram, interesting, an antidepressant. Um, and it does seem to decrease agitation a small amount in those with the least agitation and the least dementia, but they also cause problems with cognition, increasing memory problems and heart problems. And so that's why not everybody is on those. Other antidepressants, loads of information across Europe that you know, metazapine is the most widely used drug in order to try and control agitation, but no evidence that it's any good at all. But we carried out a trial and I'm gonna show you some of those data data. Antipsychotics. You'll all have heard about the problems with antipsychotics. Antipsychotics do work a bit, a little bit, uh, but they are associated with uh, an increased mortality of about 1% for every person who uses the drugs over a three-month period. Um, and that's a considerable extra mortality that is specific to people with dementia. So that is above the mortality that the general population has. This, this is a, a report that I did for the government uh, in, the, in, uh, in England, the health department in England, uh, some time ago now. And we found at that time, 25% of people were receiving these medications. And that was causing 1,800 deaths per year and about the same amount of severe cerebrovascular events. And that's similar figures you'll find anywhere across Europe, anywhere across the developed world, because that's what was being used. And that's what is still being used uh, to a large extent. One? Yeah. Okay. Very happy to take requests. Um, so here we have, so with, with focusing on it as a problem that we need to address with clinical governance through clinical governance systems in the UK, focusing on not starting these medications and keeping them for the shortest time possible, we were able to decrease the level of use of these antipsychotics over a five-year period. And that's a, a really good positive result there. 
Um, uh, and that was until uh, the pandemic happened, of course. And what you see here is, I think, a really nice example of how, when push comes to the shove in difficult circumstances, people revert to behaviors. This is clinicians, mostly general practitioners, some in general hospitals as well, to prescribe anti antipsychotic medications again. And what we see here is, the, is, is, is much of the gains disappearing uh, in the pandemic period. And we're looking to try and bring those down again. So we carried out a trial, the Sinbad trial published in 2021 in the Lancet here. It's a large multi-center randomized control trial, um, 38 centers across the UK designed to find out whether antidepressants work to treat um, uh, uh, agitation in dementia. And here's the answer. The blue line is placebo. So those are the people that got no active drug. The red line is metazapine who got the antidepressant, and you'll see that they start off with high levels of agitation. At six weeks, that agitation has decreased, and that decrease continues to 12 weeks. The decrease is nothing to do with the drugs at all. Uh, so you know, they're, they're, they all receive treatment as usual. People get better, but it's not to do with the drugs. People think it's to do with the drugs, but it's not to do with the drugs. What we do find is that there are twice the level of adverse effects with the possibility of increased death, but uh, at by that death rate evened out at one year afterwards. So this is a trial that we carried out uh, about five, six years ago, the SAD trial. The SAD trial was looking at depression in dementia, another form of uh, BPSD. And again, we see the same, same pattern here of the blue being placebo, the red sertraline, the green metazapine, and the drugs do not work any better than placebo. People get better, but it's not to do with the drugs. So I'm going to finish with a why. Why is that? What is happening here? And why are we persisting with giving people potentially dangerous drugs that don't work? So I think that we can look to, to, to Herbert Melkin, who says, for every complex problems, there's an answer that is clear, simple and wrong. And so often people seek simple answers to complex problems. Dementia is a complex problem. All of them are. That's why, you know, if we've not solved it yet. Uh, it's a complex set of problems. So coming back to the verb, the drugs don't work. They just make you worse. What does work? Well, non-drug treatment works. There's, you know, there's, um, you know, in 2014, there were 33 trials of non-drug treatment. Anything that you do to help support people with dementia in care homes or in their own homes actually decreases agitation, meaningful activities, support for carers, all sorts of things. Anything you do works. But where do you get it? Where do you get those activities? Uh, in GPs, physicians, care homes, carers, they feel they've got no access, at least in the UK. But again, I've worked a lot across, across, uh, across the world and in, and, and, uh, and in Europe. They feel they have no access. Specialist older people's mental health teams are rare and strange beasts that are not commissioned at the level to be able to provide those. And social services see it as a health thing, not a care thing, whatever. What happens is that you get very little availability of those non-drug treatments. And so what's left to the person presented with someone with a real problem that really needs to be helped, but they don't have access to this sort of care? Well, what happens is they prescribe. This is a, 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 an English prescription sheet. This is what I fill in if I want to prescribe somebody medication. And you can understand why you fall back on that, but, it's th th but understanding it doesn't make it anything better. So what does work? Well, you know, the treatment effects that we saw, sorry, the effects that we saw in SAD and in Simbad were real. People really get better. But I would suggest that it's the treatment as usual that they receive, the everyday miracles carried out by community mental health teams in terms of supporting people and problem solving and actually finding out what was going on and helping with that. That's what helps. Mental health services work. They can be provided by social care or mental health, but if nobody provides them, nobody gets them and people get drugs. So in summary, agitation, BPSD in dementia is a complex phenomena, not a simple one. And those that try to say it's simple are generally trying to sell you something.
they do, because they're complex, they demand a complex approach to management. And what's brilliant is that we know how to do that. That's what clinical care is about. That's what good quality social care is about. That's what good quality inter integrated care about. You don't need to wait for a biomarker for it. You don't need to wait for a disease modifying compound. We can provide it now. It's just that systems choose not to. So that's the rationale for secondary mental health care, social services, whatever it might be, different answers in different countries, but there is no rationale for doing nothing. That they are caused by dementia should be a last, not a first assumption, because you get lazy the minute you say it's dementia. You've got dementia, you're agitated, give them a drug. If you're in pain, antipsychotics are a really rubbish analgesic. Pharmacotherapy, a last, not a first line treatment, except in extreme circumstances. And I think that people affected by dementia, people affected by BPSD have a right to safe, effective and expert treatment. So thank you. <laughs>